Say, I saw your friend recently, Orson Welles. Oh, yes. You were, yes. you were Magnus and Ambersons and Citizen Kane. We yes. talked about that once on the, on the show. Well, I worked with Orson for 17 years. In the Mercury Theater. Yes. When he made the films, was he a perfectionist? Did he do things over and over? Was he meticulous? Or did he just have a kind of freewheeling way of getting it right the first no, time? No, no. The Ambersons, literature's most fascinating family, brought to the screen... It was a by scene in Magnificent Ambersons that was by the boiler scene. It was a very hysterical scene, and I think I went through about three or four rooms with it. And, of course, we never cut. We never stopped the camera because the camera was on little tracks, and it would stop for a close-up, or it would stop for a type two, or it's, you know, and it followed the actor. It was the audience, and it was very, very difficult. We didn't know too much about the technique of a movie making. And I remember this particular part that I was doing, he said to me, now, I want you to play it like a little girl. And of course, that wasn't the characterization that I had made up my mind to do at all. The second time he said, I want you to play it like an insane woman. And then the next time he said, now, I want you to play it like she's absolutely inebriated. And I played it that way. And again, he said, now I want you to play without absolutely, just a, an absolutely vacuous mind. And by the time I thought to myself, what in the world does he want? After about the fifth time, I began to realize what he wanted. And I did it 11 times, different characterizations. And then the 12th time, after he was absolutely satisfied with the technical part of it, he said to me, now play it. And it had a little bit of the hysteria. It had a little bit of the insanity. It had a little bit of the little girl. And he had mixed it all up in my mind so that the characterization that I played had a little bit of all of these, and it was terribly exciting. Finally, Isabel's boy, young George, played by Tim Holt, had strong, impetuous, and arrogant air to the splendor of the I wrote the script partly on King Vita's yacht off Catalina, the rest of it in Mexico. Then we rehearsed it longer than I've ever rehearsed anything because it was a relatively small cast. Everybody, we worked very hard for, I think we were five weeks rehearsing, not on set or anything, no movements, just mm -hmm. rehearsing. And then we recorded every scene so that we remembered what we thought about it so that when you came on the set there was the way it off we had decided it ought to sound even if we were going to change our oh, lives that's great. and i've done that since a lot Which but save a lot of time it actually. does uh, but also it gives you new ideas you see what's wrong and everything it's kind of for, for you to come fresh after a week or two and hear a new camera work moved very slowly let's put it that way in fact the picture took longer to shoot than any picture i've ever done instead of shorter as it was planned. As 1942 began, Wells was in production with the magnificent Ambersons, shot at RKO's Gower Street Studios in Los Angeles. The interior set walls could be adjusted to allow for continuous takes. Location shooting took place at Big Bear Lake and the San Bernardino National Forest. East LA snow scenes were shot at the ice house of the Union Ice Company downtown. The film went over budget by 20%. Wells directed but did not star. Were you deliberately looking for something in which you wouldn't appear? Yes. Why was that? I made a mistake. I shouldn't have done it. I was obsessed in my hot youth with the idea that I would not be a star. That I would only incidentally play great roles. Now, there's no such thing as incidentally playing great roles. And I was in a position to promote myself as a star. And I should have. I should have gone back to New York and played Hamlet. And as long as it was going, I didn't. I had this idea that I wanted to be known as a director. That was it. I loved Ambersons, point of Ambersons. Everything that is any good in it is that part of it which was really just a preparation for the decay of the Ambersons. 
was thought by everybody in Hollywood while I was in South America that it was too downbeat, famous Hollywood word at the time, downbeat. So it was all taken out, but it was the purpose of the movie. It's to see how they all slid downhill, you see, in one way or another. After production wrapped, Wells flew to Brazil. But in the States, the magnificent Amberson screened poorly. And Wells had negotiated away his right to the final cut. Film editor Robert Wise remembered that time. He was not up here when we previewed the film. After we got it all finished, uh, we had sent him a print, and he had some changes he wanted made, which we made, but then we took the picture out for preview. The audience just wouldn't sit still for it. They laughed at it, laughed at some of the performances, they walked out in droves, and it was as disastrous a preview as you could possibly imagine. And the studio was very naturally very upset. They had a lot of money in this film, and they wanted to get it out. So Jack Moss, who was his man here, his associate producer on the film, and I were kind of caught in the middle between Orson and his inability to come up here and do anything about it, but still wanting a voice in it, and the studio, on the other hand, who was wanting to get something done with this film that uh, would allow him to release it. In 1942, RKO underwent major changes. Nelson Rockefeller left its board of directors and studio president George Schaefer resigned. The new brass took control of Ambersons. Any Wells' attempt to protect his version ultimately failed. The basic intention of the picture was to make this golden world and then show the, what it turns into. And what is left of the picture is only the golden world and a kind of arbitrary uh, ringing down of the curtain by a series of, of clumsy, quick devices because the bad black world that came was just too much for people at that time and I wasn't there to be able to fight for it. I remember that even Joe Cotton wrote me in South America and says, you have no idea now that we've seen the whole picture together with an audience how terrifying and frightening the last part of the picture is it's just too much for the audience it's so that uh, even those people who had my interest that I felt that I'd gone too far I don't believe I had that was what I wanted to do was it was a very tough picture it's still in some ways I can think of it as, uh, as in many ways what I like best of anything I've done but it completely absent from it is the thing that would have been the, its whole point in the spring RKO cut more than 40 minutes and changed the ending. It broke significantly with the film's serious tone, but also stayed true to the ending of the novel. Bernard Herrmann's score was heavily edited. When RKO cut more than half from the soundtrack, Herrmann severed ties with the film and promised legal action if his name wasn't removed from the credits. I would have to say this, that I think from a purely artistic point of view, purely that, it was probably a better film in its entirety. From a film bus standpoint, I don't think there's any question there. But we are faced with the realities of the other part of it. And I think the fact that the film has come down through the years in its own right is somewhat of a minor, if not more than that, classic, means that we didn't really bastardize it completely. Ultimately, the Magnificent Ambersons lost RKO Meanwhile in Brazil, Wells worked on It's All True. He'd conceived it as an omnibus film mixing documentary and fiction, comprising several stories about Pan-American culture from the Arctic to Tierra del Fuego. While in Rio de Janeiro, Wells planned to shoot Carnival and Jan Gaderos, or Four Men on a Raft. In return for all profits, RKO was to put up $1.2 million for the film. As co-producer of the project, the OCIAA guaranteed 300 grand against any losses RKO might incur. There was no time to prepare a script. It wasn't possible until Wells arrived. All parties understood this and agreed. As an emissary of the U.S. government, Wells had to give up the Lady Esther show, and he received no salary. But tensions were boiling with RKO because of Ambersons. Wells ignored their phone calls and shot what he wanted. He was bitter, 
and felt the new board of directors was ignorant and going out of their way to make sure his projects failed. It's gone. The whole end of it. The whole uh, an actual plot was changed. Do you ever get over something like that? Not really. You don't. You don't. But you see, I was in terrible trouble then because I was sent to South America by Nelson Rockefeller and Jack Whitney. I was told that it was my patriotic duty to go and spend a million dollars shooting the carnival in Rio. Now, I don't like things like carnivals and Mardi Gras and all that, but they put it to me that it would be a real contribution to inter-American affairs in the Latin American world and so on. So without a salary, but with a budget of a million dollars, I was sent to Rio to make up a movie about the carnival. But in the meantime, RKO is now a new government. And they ask to see the rushes of what I'm doing in South America. And they see a lot of people, black people. And the reaction is, he's just shooting a lot of jigaboos jumping up and down. They didn't even hear the samba music because it hadn't been synced up. RKO was expecting stately and efficient vignettes. They instead received footage of wild interracial gatherings of common people. From the studio's point of view, releasing this to the U.S. public was dangerous and reckless. So I was fired from RKO. They made a great publicity point of the fact that I had gone to South America without a script and thrown all this money away. I never recovered from that attack. So the fact that they had also, they had promised me when I went to South America that they would send a moviola and cutters to me and that I would finish the cutting of Ambersons there. They never did. They cut it themselves. So they destroyed Ambersons and the picture itself destroyed me. I didn't get a job as a director for years afterwards. Orson Welles returned to the United States on August 22, 1942 after more than six months in South America. He sought to continue the project elsewhere, managing to purchase some of the footage. But Welles eventually had to relinquish ownership back to RKO. He couldn't afford to pay the storage costs. It occurred to me that the origins of Samba lay in voodoo ceremonies, particularly in Shangu, which are practiced up in uh, the favelas, those strange native settlements on the mountains, which are right in the midst of the city of Rio. And so I arranged with a good deal of difficulty to film a voodoo ceremony. And uh, we had protracted conversations with the head of the group, this doctor. An advance payment was arranged for. He came to my office in Rio to discuss it. And it was my unhappy lot to have to tell him that the filming was off because I had just received word from Hollywood that the president of the film studio had been rather abruptly removed. A new president was in his place and the entire project was off. There was no more money to spend on voodoo ceremonies. And the witch doctor assured me that this was deeply offensive, that he and his group took it very badly. And I said I was most sorry about it myself. I did want to finish the film, and I did hope he understood. Ah, but he said, we have spent money. We have bought entirely new costumes. And I said, well, I'm awfully sorry, but there just isn't any money from Hollywood to pay you. And I, I don't know how I can explain to this new administration that the voodoo ceremony must continue. And I was called away to the telephone again, left the doctor in my office, had a long conversation on the phone, begging and pleading to be allowed to finish this picture, which we rather liked. The material was very interesting, and I thought it would be a good thing to finish since so much effort had gone into it. And I was pleading my cause for some time, praying that we would be able to. And I came back to the office and found that the doctor had gone, having been told that the deal was completely off, and that on my desk, in a script of the film, was a long steel needle it had been driven entirely through the script, and to the needle was attached a length of red wool. This was the mark of the voodoo. The end of that story is that it was the end of the film. We were never allowed to finish it. While some of the footage shot for It's All True was repurposed, approximately 200,000 feet of Technicolor nitrate negative, most of it for the Carnival episode was later dumped into the Pacific Ocean. <laughs> 